Of all the pirates who terrorized the Caribbean, there are none as widely loved and honored as Jean Lafitte. Lafitte, although a violent smuggler and pirate, has long been considered a folk hero in Louisiana and Texas, having helped America in the War of 1812. But was this an action done out of heroism, or simply another step in his hopes to live out a bygone age of piracy? Surprisingly little is known about Lafitte's past. He was likely born in the early 1780s in the Bordeaux region of France, although some sources suggest it could have been Port-au-Prince, but less popular of a historical idea. All the same, there's no historically agreed upon date or location. To a certain extent, it is almost pointless to bother with the details of Lafitte's early life because, quote, much of what is known, including everything contained in the journal he supposedly wrote, was totally invented. In fact, the earliest information we know about Lafitte is that his older brother, Pierre, left France for the Caribbean in the 1790s and made it to Louisiana by 1802. Pierre spent the next few years establishing a business as a merchant and smuggler in the New Orleans area. In 1793, France was embroiled in revolution, and Spain took up arms to oppose the revolutionaries in the War of the First Coalition. At this time, New Orleans was in Spanish possession. Due to her proximity to French territory, Spanish New Orleans braced herself for a French invasion, which never came. This, combined with the declining state of the Spanish Empire, resulted in New Orleans creating an independent identity unique among the colonial settlements of the area, quote, enjoying a measure of independence with almost total freedom of trade. By 1803, New Orleans was ceded to France, but this would only last for a matter of months before control shifted to the United States. Under American jurisdiction, the Embargo Act of December 1807, limiting trade with foreign ports and abolition of the importation of African slaves in January of 1808, led to major shortages in the New Orleans economy for both trade goods and slave workers. By 1810, the population of New Orleans was an estimated 24,552, only 3,200 of which were English or American, the rest being Spanish and French, or Creoles and Cajuns. The Creole population was highly distrustful of the new American occupiers, but sympathetic towards any and all French or Spanish residents, regardless of their legal status. The constantly shifting loyalties in New Orleans, racial tensions, and the new economic policies provide an important context for the pirate safe haven it would soon become. In 1809, Jean Lafitte came to New Orleans to join his brother. The Levite brothers established a small business which, quote, reportedly served as a depot for smuggled goods and slaves brought ashore by a band of privateers. Because of the trade embargo and restrictions against importing slaves, the Lafites stumbled across an untapped market in smuggling. The brothers quickly found success with their new business venture, making their trades on a small barrier island called Grand Terre in the area known as Barataria Bay. The aforementioned sympathies of the Creoles meant that Lafites had a wide range of New Orleans citizens willing to accept them, even if they were criminals. As French ports in the Caribbean rapidly fell under British control from 1809 to 1810, Barataria Bay became a hub for pirates and privateers sailing under French letters of marque. During this time, Jean Lafitte claimed to have French letters of marque himself, but there is no record as to how he would have legitimately obtained them. Regardless of this nominal privateer status, he acted as an unaligned, independent pirate, as, quote, merchant vessels of every nation, neutral or not, fell prey to his raiders. By the beginning of 1814, Jean Lafitte's raids on merchant ships were attracting the attention of major governments, notably the United States. In January of that year, a small skirmish broke out between a small band of smugglers and Louisiana customs officials leaving two officials wounded and one dead. Records are inconsistent on whether the Lafittes were actually seen at the skirmish or if it was a completely unrelated event attributed to them because of their domination of smuggling in the region. Regardless, Governor Claiborne issued a wanted notice for the brothers for murder. Claiborne also raised local militia to hunt down the smugglers and pirates in Barataria. On top of this, the privateers' attacks on Spanish shipping caused diplomatic problems now that Spain was a neutral nation. These factors led Claiborne to seek the assistance of Commodore Patterson to wipe out the Lafitte's pirates in Barataria. On September 16th, American naval forces raided the pirate base in Barataria, imprisoning Jean Lafitte. 
While this is where the story would end for most pirates, this is just where Lafitte's story begins. The War of 1812 had been going on for two years already, and General Andrew Jackson was severely undersupplied to provide a proper defense of New Orleans. While in prison, Lafitte was offered a deal by Governor Claiborne. Lafitte and all the pirates from Barataria would be granted amnesty in exchange for their help in the war. Lafitte had previously been offered a bribe of roughly 30,000 pounds, which would be about $2 million today, to join the British in the war. Regardless of the fact that they were outlaws, the Baratarians did not want to overthrow America, especially if it was part of, quote, a British scheme to conquer America. After careful consideration, Jean Lafitte decided to side with the Americans. He provided Jackson's army with, quote, 7,500 desperately needed gunflints and two batteries of artillerists, about 400 men, under the command of Baratarians, Dominique Yu and Renato Belusha, and a few dozen seamen skilled at naval gunnery to help man Patterson's ships and his defensive batteries set up on the Mississippi River. There is no historical consensus on the extent to which Lafitte helped with the battle itself, but there is no doubt that the weapons he supplied were invaluable to the American victory. The exact details of the battle are also quite unclear, as so much of it has been convoluted with legends. The important thing, though, is the result of the battle. America repelled the British in a decisive victory, and amnesty was granted to Jean Lafitte and all members of the Baratarian community who had aided in the defense of New Orleans. After the War of 1812 was over, Jean Lafitte returned to his old ways of piracy and smuggling. From 1815 to 1817, he worked as a spy for Spain during the Mexican War of Independence. Jean found out about numerous plots to undermine Spanish rule in the Western Hemisphere, such as, quote, a plan to incite a slave rebellion in Cuba, probably to distract Spaniards while a new Texas colony was planted. This Texas colony was another plot that Lafitte uncovered, where the brother of the exiled emperor was going to set up a colony in Texas of refugees loyal to the old emperor. During his time as a Spanish spy, Lafitte found a new island to use as his base of operations to replace Grand Terre, Galveston. On April 22, 1817, the Lafitte brothers reconvened in New Orleans to concoct a new plot to present to the Spanish. They planned to utilize Galveston as a permanent base of operations, from which to launch their pirate raids, under the protection of the Spanish government, quote, taking Galveston with the bay full of corsairs and pirates, thus closing off further supply of men and material to the Mexican rebels. Spain accepted this plan, and Galveston was officially made the Lafitte's new Barataria. New Orleans officials were wary of the new pirate base, as the Lafitte's would no longer sell their stolen goods in New Orleans, but may still raid incoming commerce. Jean knew this could pose a problem, so he attempted to lay low. Quote, he would seek to appease Spain and, at the same time, hope for immunity from the Navy of the United States. This did not last long, however. Spain was reluctant to give Lafitte too much leeway to raid the rebels, and Lafitte was getting increasingly more restless. Jean knew it was too dangerous a world to be an independent pirate, so he really needed a privateering commission from any formal state. Lafitte went to the newly independent governments in Buenos Aires and Bolivia, but failed to obtain a commission. It was soon clear that, quote, the Lafittes were not going to get what they needed to operate against Spain, and Spain was disinclined to give them agency against the rebels. The United States wanted nothing to do with them. In 1820, Lafitte sent raiding parties to Cuba, hoping to harass Spanish forces there. Soon enough, he finally obtained letters of marque. Lafitte officially became a French privateer in 1822, and in exchange, some ships in Cuba would no longer be targeted. This would not last long, as Lafitte would be mercilessly hunted down by American, British, and Spanish ships in the Gulf of Mexico, tired of being raided by his pirates. Lafitte's death is just as mysterious as his origins. In early 1823, numerous raids were made on Lafitte's pirate fleet. In March, Lafitte's fleet was defeated off the coast of Puerto Rico. According to reports, Lafitte had a total of 39 ships, all of which were taken in a matter of days. The British took, quote, roughly half of them, killed 20 pirates, captured 40 more. The Spanish took the majority of the rest of his ships, killed an indeterminate number of pirates. 
Jean Lafitte was somewhere among the dead, although no one seems to know who exactly killed him. As the remnants of his fleet were wiped out by 1825, there are a few scattered reports of his survival until that year, although it is highly unlikely. Lafitte was certainly a greedy pirate, but he did have his moments of heroism. While he and his brother Pierre may have smuggled slaves into America and stole from traders for their own benefit, they still managed to have some level of principle. Their support for Andrew Jackson in the Battle of New Orleans was partially out of self-interest, but it does not lessen the positive effects that they had. It really seems as though Lafitte was just desperately trying to live out the adventures of pirates just a hundred years prior. Sadly for him, the age of piracy in the Caribbean had long since passed, and he would be restricted to smuggling and seeking the protection of foreign governments rather than raiding ships at will and living out the idealized pirate's life of freedom on the high seas. This is post-editing Matthew realizing I just forgot to put in any internal citations, so hopefully this ending source page works fine for that. I do have more projects in the works, some very close to being ready, so keep a close eye on my channel. Videos should be coming out pretty soon. I hope you will enjoy it all, and let me know what you think in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe, and follow me on other platforms. Links are in the description. This has been Matthew of Late Modern History, and I hope to see you next time. Goodbye, goodbye, when the dear baby dear from your eye, though it's hard to pass, I know, I know, I'll be sick of the death to go, don't cry, don't die, there's a silver lining in the sky, bonsoir, old king, cheerio, chin, chin, na, boo, too.